Ouch! Oof. Maybe some of you have run into a piece of furniture, a bed, a night table, something that has gotten in your way, and you stubbed your toe, and suddenly out of your mouth came, Ouch! Or a gasp of pain at the very least, as you hopped around for about three seconds, or maybe limped around for about three seconds, the pain quickly subsided. It becomes a quick nuisance, as any of you know, if you've ever stubbed your toe. At first, it's maybe a shock of severe pain, but it passes, just to be a memory as time goes on. Well, that is what I believe the chief priests and teachers of the law thought that Jesus was. I think they thought that he was a toe, a, a stubbing of their toes, that he was a simple nuisance, someone who would get in their way for a short time. I think the chief priests and the teachers of the law figured in no, in no time at all, he'll be gone. They'd c seen teachers come and go before. In fact, if you think about it, in Scripture, we have one teacher who came and went just in the time of Jesus' own ministry. That is John the Baptist. His ministry was cut short by King Herod when he refused, when, he, when his daughter-in-law asked for uh, John the Baptist's head on a platter. So I believe the teachers of the law expected Jesus to be that brief pain in the shin or pain in the toe, but he'd be gone soon enough. Little did they expect him to become much more than that. Little did they expect him to become the one who would conquer death and defeat death in their face. To, to, to conquer death, to be the stone, the foundation stone, not merely a simple stumbling stone. In fact, as Matthew says, he was much more than that. The crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. He taught as one with authority. So even early in his ministry, those who came to see him, they knew there was something different. They knew that there was something about him. He wasn't just flash in the pan and gone tomorrow. He wasn't just there to wow them, take their money and run. I think the chief priests and the teachers of the law would have preferred that. It would have been easier. Because notice how Matthew ended that there. Not like the teachers of the law. The crowds had grown tired and weary of the teachers of the law. The crowds had grown tired of their same old nonsense, their same old duplicitous lifestyles, their hypocritical, hypocritical teachings. The teachers of the law, they needed to do something to this nuisance. But little did they know that by his death, he would show his ultimate victory. That by his death, he would show his power. That death could not defeat him. That death had no ruling over him. By his death, Jesus would conquer by his resurrection, he gave us the promise of salvation. Not some small nuisance, not something that could be swept under the rug. It was They tried to, didn't they? They tried to push it away and forget about it, but that was not something that could be done. The changing of the heart, the burning that was within him lasted. It stayed. It had sticking power, if you will. If only, as we understand it, people would look to Christ as that cornerstone. And Jesus actually, as he used that phrase in Mark, I don't know if you caught it right at the end there, he's quoting Psalm chapter 118. And he was well aware of, a, well, what basically a legend that the Jews had. And as he called himself the cornerstone, the stumbling stone that became the cornerstone, he was aware of a legend that had sprung up around the time of that psalm was written. Now you may or may not know this legend, but, but David wrote, as he wrote the psalms, uh, he, he wrote them well before Solomon's temple. But as they were building Solomon's temple, as the legend goes, the, the quarry, the men in the quarry would cut the stones. They would prepare the stones and cut them to the dimensions that they were supposed to be. Then they would send those stones up from the quarry to the temple, and the builders would then assemble the temple as it went. And the temple, I don't know if you've read this recently, but in 1 Kings chapter 6, it said it took seven years to build. Well, as they were in the process of building the temple, as they started to put things together, the, the builders, one, or the quarry men, one day sent up a stone that just didn't fit with the rest. It was a different shape, and it was a different size. And so they rolled it down into the Kidron Valley. And you may better know the Kidron Valley as the Valley of Gehenna, or in other words, the garbage heap, the valley where they put their garbage and their waste. As time went on, during the seven years, they were, finally came to the point when they were in need of the capstone, the stone that would hold the entire temple together. The stone that would be the foundation stone that would hold things that would not lean to the left or to the right. That would not fall and crumble. 
And they sent out word to the quarrymen and said, Where is this stone? Where is the st- capstone? The quarrymen sent word back up to them and said, Well, that is the stone that we sent up to you years ago already. The men looked at one another. One of the builders who had been on the site for some time said, I remember now. And they sent men down into that valley of garbage, into those heaps of trash, and they recovered that capstone. And out of the valley of garbage, out of that Kidron Valley, the stone was placed and was the cornerstone. So beautiful when you see Jesus' own words there taking place. Sometimes we just read right over that and we say, what a neat image that Christ is the cornerstone, that He is the foundation of our faith. Little do we see sometimes how, how He does fit in, how He does speak to the people of His time, how He speaks to us today. And if only people understood Jesus as the cornerstone. It would make it really easy, wouldn't it? But that's wishful thinking. We all live in a world today where Christ is not the cornerstone. We live in a world today where it's easier to believe another world's view. In fact, more often than not, it is Christ's message that is a stumbling stone, isn't it? There's a lot of worldviews out there. Prosperity will come to those who work hard. By sacrifice, by your own works, you can bring about your salvation. By your own knowledge, your brain power, you can reach enlightenment. These are all easy because they're things we can do. We struggle because when we face that stumbling stone, it's not something we can do. In fact, though, it's even worse than worldviews outside of the church. Because when you think about it, it's not just outside the church that these views are coming up, but inside the church as well. It's much easier to preach something watered down, something easy, some nice words, some kind words, than to preach the law that convicts us of our sin and preach the gospel, the redemption of Christ. In fact, not too many years ago, you all, you all may recognize his name, but there was a sweet theologian by the name of Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner was a bishop in the Catholic Church, and he presented a, the view of what is called the anonymous Christian. You may or may not be familiar with this ideology, but it goes something like this. The anonymous Christian is one who can be saved by Christ without ever knowing Christ. Hopefully you're doing a double take on that one. Because when we look at Scripture, it does anywhere in Scripture say that we can be saved without knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Is there anywhere in Scripture that says that without faith in our Savior that we can be saved? I'll give you a clue. The answer is no. In Acts chapter 4, in fact, as we heard today, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Not might we might, not we may be saved. We must be saved by the name of Jesus, by the belief and faith we have. And Paul uh, goes a little further in Romans chapter 10 and says, Faith comes by hearing. By hearing the gospel preached. By hearing the conviction of our sins and knowing that we have forgiveness through Jesus alone. But it's not exactly easy to preach. Because it it does become a stumbling block. It does get in the way and it seems not only in our lives, but in the lives of other people. When we tell them that they have to be saved by one way, they might get offended. The gospel is not exactly inclusive, is it? In fact, it's very exclusive. Unless you believe, you cannot be saved. And so as we hear those words there, we see that we are not only called to hear them, but we are actually called to be stumbling blocks as well. Now don't hear what I'm not saying here. Because there are a lot of Christians who hear that word stumbling block and they say, whoa, back up a little bit. A stumbling block is someone who gets in the way of faith. And that's true. There are those Christians who are overzealous for their faith. And don't get me wrong, being zealous for your faith is a good thing. But being overzealous and alienating people and driving them from the faith, that's not what I'm talking about here. There are stumbling blocks that way in the faith. There are people who stand in the way of people coming, uh, of those who are lost, hearing the gospel. But when I talk about stumbling blocks, us becoming stumbling blocks, I'm talking about us being stumbling blocks for the world, standing in the way of the world, speaking a different worldview, the true worldview of Christ Jesus, not what is popular, not what is easy, not what is right. Being there and being among the lost and the dying, being among those who do not know the gospel, and speaking the truth, speaking it in love. Now that should be easy, but sometimes it's hard, isn't it? 
To be the one who stops a rumor in its path. To be the one who calls a lie a lie. To be the one who is honest when others are not being honest. Sometimes that's pretty hard. Maybe not with the circle of friends you are in, but just go out into the business world today, into many a different areas today of the world, and you'll find that lying, cheating, and stealing is, well, that's commonplace. And that's sad. Because we as Christians, as stumbling blocks in the world, we should be making people stub their toes. Causing people to stop and think for a minute and and to realize that that is not the way that God has designed them to be. That as we live our lives, we should be setting that example of Christian, of Christ to the people. And it's hard though. Because those stumbling blocks have a tendency to irritate people. To get people mad. But it's necessary. Not only is it necessary for us to be there to cause people to stumble, but when we are stumbling blocks in the world, we also cause Satan to stumble. We trip him up in his plots and his plans. Satan likes nothing better than to drive people from the church, to drive one Christian against another Christian. He likes nothing better than to keep people from their faith. And so as often as he can, he will. He'll create reasons to sleep in on Sunday morning, to, to, to close our Bible and set it aside for later. But when later never comes, to maybe, well, praying is just a quip here and there, instead of taking time to truly speak to God and to hear His Word back to us. But when we are Christians who are stumbling blocks in the world, and when we are Christians who are stumbling blocks in the world, we take time in, our, in His Word. We take time to, to be there, to be there for other Christians. We take time to study and to pray together. We take time to worship together. Because those are the stumbling blocks that slowly get built up. And so instead of tripping Satan up, we become a wall. We become a wall that blocks Satan. And that wall is not reinforced by us, but reinforced by the Holy Spirit. And we become a wall that keeps Satan who, to, from c- carrying out his th- the deeds that he'd like to. We become a wall built together and strengthened together that protects those who are lost so that they might hear the good news of the gospel. And we become a wall that leaves Satan impotent because he has no power against our risen king. But most importantly, we have to be there. As stumbling blocks, we have to be there. We have to be there in the lives of people. Jesus didn't sit in the church. He didn't sit in the temple. He didn't wait in his house for people to come to him, did he? Jesus was out there in the streets. He was with the prostitutes. He was with the thieves. He was with the tax collectors. He was with all those people who no one else wanted to be with. And he was a stumbling block in their lives. He was a stumbling block who said that even when the rest of the world said you're worthless, even when the rest of the world said you're a dirty sinner, he said, I love you. He said, I'm going to be here for you. And my salvation is enough for you even when no one else wanted them. They were worthy to Jesus. And we are called in the same way to be there. We are called to be there, to be in the lives of those who are lost and dying. It's so hard to share our faith behind church walls. It's so hard to share our faith hidden away at home. It's great if we want to share with friends and family. But it's hard to share with those who are lost and dying. It's hard to share with those who haven't heard the promise of salvation. It's hard to share with those who have been caught up in the world and all the false saviors who have been put out there and feel worthless and empty. It's hard to share with them and fill them up with the gospel of Jesus Christ when we don't go there and be in their lives. And we are called to be there. We are called to step outside, to step out in faith and be a stumbling to be the one who trips up people in their worldview so that they know that there is something greater out there, that there is a promise that has overcome all promises, the promise of salvation in Jesus. And we are called to be there, even as hard as it may be. And being a stumbling block can be hard because it can cause divisions in a husband and a wife. It can cause divisions between a parent and their child. It can cause division between grandparents and grandchildren the husband or the wife who believes in Jesus and shares their faith may alienate their spouse who doesn't want to hear anything about it. The child who has come to faith, who has received the Holy Spirit, the Gospel, 
who shares their faith with their parents. They may be alienated from their parents because of their word. Because of that promise that they say that Jesus is the only way. The grandparent who shares their love with their grandchild, only seeking to share the good news of salvation. Maybe have the phone hung up on them and the door slammed in their face because the child, the, their grandchild doesn't want to hear that message from church. And it can hurt. It can hurt to be rejected in that way. It can hurt to have people turn their back on us, to slam their door in our face. It can hurt because of the fact that we feel rejected. But the truth is, it is not us who is being rejected, but it is the gospel. It is the words of Jesus Christ that are being rejected. And when someone is rejecting those words, they are not, not rejecting us, but they are rejecting Jesus. But even as they reject us, we don't become a stumbling block. At least not one who keeps them from the faith. Even as they reject us, we still seek to share our faith. We still seek to pray for them. We still seek to share the worship, to bring them to worship. Because our God, He's not interested in a bunch of people who are forgiven, who are perfect. He's looking for us sinners. For each one of us. He's looking for those sinners who are here today and those sinners who are outside the doors today. He's looking for those sinners who have, have heard His gospel and rejected them and those who have, heard, who have never heard the gospel. He's looking for those sinners because He wants to tell them, you are worthy to Me. I went to the cross. I died for you. And our Lord and our Savior, He did go to the cross. He died and He became that stumbling stone, the one that stood in the way of the world, but became the cornerstone. The one who is the foundation of our faith. The one who unites us together and holds us together. The one who put, packs us in, who holds us in place. That even in the darkest and the depths and even as we are rejected, He puts us together and builds us up. Because it was not just an end, it, things did not just end in an empty tomb on a painful cross. But things were end, have not come to an end yet. Because Christ declared victory. Because He did die on the cross. But He destroyed the death and He rose from the grave. And so we say, Alleluia, Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. And we praise our Lord. And it is not just something that happens on Easter Sunday. It is not just something that we say, Alleluia, Christ has risen on Easter Sunday. But each day of our lives, because He has risen and He is the one who sustains us each day. He is the one who builds us up each day. And He is the foundation who will one day lead us to be home with Him forever. And so we look to the cross. We see that that is an empty cross. We open the tomb. We see that it is an empty tomb. And we see that one day we will have empty tombs because we will be lifted up and raised up and we will be made whole again in our Savior's presence. Alleluia. Amen. Please pray with me. Jesus, we give thanks to you that you have been the stumbling stone. That at times we have stubbed our, stubbed our own toes on you. That we, have, that we have struggled in our faith. That we have wrestled with the words of, your, of you. But help us each day to know that they are the words of truth. That they are the foundation of our faith. May we not only hear those words, though, Lord, but may we live out our faith. May we be the stumbling stone that gets in the way of others that they may know the promise of salvation, that it may stop, make them stop and think and realize that there is someone greater. There is a promise that has not been broken, and there is the salvation that we have. And so may we always know that with full assurance that even as we go through this Easter season, even as we go through the darkest of valleys, through the Lent of our lives, May we know the joy that one day we will rise with you, that we will join you forever in eternity. So in your name we pray.